We are in the book of 1 Samuel. If you have a Bible, you want to open up to 1 Samuel chapter 2 for our message, A Life That Honors God. In this passage of Scripture, there's a very uh, powerful statement that a man of God, a prophet, states to Eli, the high priest. He says, whoever honors me, the Lord says, I will honor, but whoever despises me, I will lightly esteem. And this concept of honoring the Lord, the word literally means heavy, that you're, you're heavy towards the Lord. And that word can be used in a lot of different contexts. It's three times used for Pharaoh whose heart was heavy or hard against the Lord. So every single one of us uh, have a heaviness, if you will. Our life is tilted or bent towards something. And in this passage of Scripture, you'll really want to... Um, rekindle that fire if you're kind of uh, drifting a bit in your walk with the Lord to honor him. Because the Lord says, you know what? If your heart is heavy towards me, weighted for glory towards me, then I will be weighted towards you. I will honor you. And I don't know about you, but I really want the Lord to honor my life. And I want to honor him. And the Lord says those things go back and forth. But if you despise the Lord, he says he will lightly esteem you, or he won't put any weightiness your direction from his perspective. And yet in this story, to catch you up, because there's really a woman who was heavy towards the Lord or weighted towards the Lord to honor the Lord. Her name was Hannah. We looked at her in chapter 1. Hannah was a heartbroken woman who could not have children. And because she couldn't have children, there was a barrenness in her soul. There was a struggle in her soul. To compound that, uh, Elkanah, her husband, who loved her very much, actually had two wives. And, and Peninnah had a whole past of kids, and she just rubbed it in Hannah's face all the time. And so as we worked our way through chapter one, we discovered that the heaviness and the grief and the sorrow and the misery of Hannah's heart drove her deep into the arms of the Lord, so much so that she went deeper with the Lord to say, you know what, Lord, if you'll bless me with a son, I'll give him back to you. That's right. I'll give him back to you for the rest of his life. If you'll just bless me with the joy and the privilege of having one son, I'll give him back to you for the rest of his life. And the Lord, you see through circumstances, and I want you to know this in your life and my life, through circumstances, the Lord's always wanting to drive us deeper into our relationship with him, that we honor him and we're heavy or weighted towards him. Because we can go through life really kind of lightly esteeming the Lord, and we're busy about that, and we're really into this, and this is our great hobby, and we spend all our money on that, and this is what has our heart and our affections. But when circumstances seem to corral us and funnel us towards the Lord, a brokenness in which we really surrender and we understand that the only answer to the sorrow, the depth of my heart, is God. There, there's no other answer. And so Hannah went deep into the arms of the Lord. She promised a son to the Lord. The Lord was getting a hold of her heart. He blessed her with conception. And now at the end of chapter one, she had given back her little boy after he had been weaned. Now they would wean a child about three to four years of age. And so little Samuel's three or four years of age, what a fun age that is. For you who are parents, you know what a joy it is to have a three or four year old and how much fun they are. And at that moment, Hannah brings him to the house of the Lord and she says, Eli, to the high priest, here's my boy. I sat here pouring my heart out in prayer, and Eli actually blessed her that she might have the answer to her petition. And now here's the little boy, Samuel. Now, at the end of this, when she presents him, after this three- to four-year period of time, chapter 2 breaks out in the first 10 verses with this incredible, spontaneous prayer of praise of who God is. And I want to lay this, found, this groundwork so that you have the foundation to understand only those hearts who want to honor the Lord understand what Hannah's about to say. Because you who honor the Lord and you who are here on this Wednesday night and you have discovered and fallen in love with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, this prayer of praise, this spontaneous rising up to God from Hannah is going to resonate with your own soul because those who honor the Lord know who he is. They know who he is and what his character is and all of those things. 
And so check it out as we begin in verse 1 of chapter 2. It says, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Notice that Hannah prays, it's spontaneous, and she just says, you know what, my heart is rejoicing in the Lord. My horn or that uh, source of authority and strength from the Lord is exalted in the Lord. God's done this work in my life. I smile at my enemies. Now, only when your heart is really honoring the Lord do you want to smile at your enemies. You usually want to sneer at your enemies, correct? But she said, you know what, when I can trust God, I don't have to worry about my enemies, you got an enemy going on in your life right now? When you just seek the Lord and honor the Lord, you can smile at your enemies and rejoice in his salvation. Man, I'm saved. If God be for me, who can be against me? I'm on my way to heaven. What kind of light affliction here could distract me from a life of joy and worship and service and even the enemies in my life I can smile at him. Now, through this, all of us who went through chapter 1, no, you can't help but if this is a, a veiled attempt at uh, kind of a, a vindication that God has brought because of um, Peninnah, and, and, and maybe not, maybe she's, this is just not that at all, but you can't help but think about the hard time that Peninnah gave to Hannah, and now she's like, you know, I can look at her and I can smile. It's just no sweat. She was giving me a hard time. She was razzing me, but in the Lord, it really doesn't matter. Verse 2, no one is holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. When you honor the Lord like Hannah honors the Lord, and you discover that there is no one holy like the Lord, have you really discovered an intimacy with the Lord and a recognition of how holy God is? Everybody that really gets a good glimpse of the Lord all through Scripture, whether it's Peter after the great catch of fish and he realizes that God's in his boat and he gets on his knees and says, Lord, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. Or it's Isaiah after, uh, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and his, the train of his robe filled the temple. And he said, man, I'm, I'm undone. I'm, I'm just coming apart at the seams because God is holy. He's holy. And everybody that has that glimpse, whether it's Daniel having that glimpse and he fell down as if he was a dead man, and yet the Lord reached down and touched him and gave him strength. The holiness of the Lord and the altogether separateness of the Lord when he says there's none besides you, there's no rock like our God. There's no solid foundation that you can have in this life. Think about it. Would you put the same trust you're putting in the Lord, would you put that into academics? Would you put it into science? Would you put it into a human relationship that can fail you? Would you put it into the stock market? Would you put it into your own strength and your own intellect and your own ability? Where would you put your trust? There's no rock like God. He's the only one that you can put this kind of radical trust in. And depending in the degree that you put your trust in him, you agree with that statement. There's no rock like our God. There's, no, there's nobody like that. And, and Hannah could say that. And those who have discovered that in our life, I've discovered that. There's no rock like God. There's nowhere I can run and hide like in the arms of the Lord. She goes on to say in verse 3, Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. Man, it humbles us that how we might be braggadocious or talk about how smart we are, how strong we are, how capable we are, when we get a glimpse of the Lord, all that melts into oblivion and we go, man, God knows everything and God weighs the actions of every heart. It's a mind-blowing thing. Just think about it. God knows everything about me. God knows all my thoughts, which is a scary thing. It's a scary thing. When Jesus was on planet Earth, the Pharisees would be thinking something, and it would say, Jesus knew their thoughts. Now, wouldn't that be freaky? You hang out with Jesus? Now, I know a lot of people say, you know, if I just had one time in history to live, I would be with Jesus. Well, realize when you're hanging out with Jesus, as the Pharisees, when they thought these thoughts, Jesus would look at them and he knew their thoughts. And, I mean, there's sometimes that you don't want anybody to know your thoughts, correct? You're like, I wish I didn't have that thought. And you look across the table, there's Jesus like, Bad thoughts, Ricky. Bad thoughts. And so 
he not only knows our thoughts, but he also weighs the actions. He knows, what I, he knows why I'm doing what I'm doing. He knows the motives of my heart. He knows the intents of my heart. He knows all of those things. Verse 4, the bows of the mighty men are broken, and those who stumbled are girded with strength. Notice the contrast now as he goes into uh, contrasts of things. Those who were mighty, their bow and arrows, if you will, have been broken. But those who stumbled, God filled with strength. The proud and those who are fighting against the Lord, their bow is broken. They're humbled. They're brought to nothing. But the person that was trusting God, God has girded them with strength and filled them with his supernatural power. Verse 5, those who are full have hired themselves out for bread, and the hungry have ceased to hunger. Even the barren has borne seven, and she who has many children has become feeble. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave, and he brings up. He says, you know what? The Lord gives children, and those who were producing children now are barren or drying up, contrasting back and forth that God's in control. God kills. God makes alive. God can resurrect. He, he brings down to the grave, and he brings up. These are impressive concepts since we don't have the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus yet. We don't have any of the miracles of somebody being raised from the dead, but here Hannah is, heavy towards the Lord, weighted towards God's direction, and she knows who God is. There's no rock like our God. It's impressive, isn't it, to meet a godly woman that has that kind of firm hold on who God is as we meet Hannah in the scriptures right here? Verse 7 says, the Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength no man shall prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces, for from heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. You see, there's no even, not even a king in Israel now. Most believe that this is the first real glimpse that we see that Hannah prophetically sees that there is a king coming. Ultimately, there is a King Saul, there's a King David, there's a King Solomon. But even beyond those human kings, there's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Son of David, the Lord Jesus, the Anointed One, the Christ. And so in this glimpse, as the Spirit of God is prompting this precious woman of the Lord, she even gives us the first hint or glimpse, hey, here the Messiah is coming. Now, at the end of this, it says in verse 11, Then Elkanah went to his house at Ramah, but the child ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. So you have Hannah praising the Lord. The family loads up. They leave little, I mean, this had to be heartbreaking. I can't imagine. Can you imagine leaving your little three or four-year-old, and he's there with Eli the priest, and they're, they're going off, and, and here's this little boy. Maybe he begins to cry. Mom, don't leave me. Mom, don't leave me. I remember that first day of kindergarten for four, both of my children. And uh, both my kids, they were actually great with it. A mom cried her eyes out. But the kids are like, go away. They got their backpack. They got their lunch pail. They're ready. But it's for, it's for three hours. It's not for life. Right? They know you're going to come at noon. It's kindergarten. And yet they go off to Ramah. And it says in verse 12, now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. What a contrast. I want you to know that there's a family that appears to be incredibly honoring in the Lord. Elkanah, Hannah, now they give their little boy Samuel to Eli. And they're giving it to a family that Eli the priest, though he doesn't seem to be so bad a character himself, but he's a lousy father. Like a lot of guys, they know how to do their profession okay, but they don't know how to raise kids. They don't know how to invest in their kids. They don't know how to uh, love them, tell them the truth, and discipline them. And that's Eli. Now, it's one thing. It's, it's tragic enough when you have children that um, are going to embarrass you through their corruptness and their life of sin. But when it's in the house of the Lord, now it's amplified because, you see, James 3.1 says, not many should seek to be masters or teachers because we will have the stricter judgment. 
that when you serve the Lord or as a priest, Eli's the high priest, his sons are serving as priests underneath their father, and there's a, there's a narrower standard, there's a higher standard, there's a greater accountability we have when we represent the Lord. And even for me, that's why I love to just teach verse by verse, because it's hard for me to get myself in trouble. One day I'm going to have to give an account to the Lord for how I shared God's word with you, his precious people. And God's going to hold me to a stricter judgment than he's going to hold you for your walk with God. Now, I don't, I don't really like that. Why should I be judged stricter than you guys? That's, that's a drag. And yet God says, you know what? This is what I've called you to do. You're going to have the stricter judgment, so therefore walk in the fear of the Lord. Okay. Makes my knees want to knock just a little bit. But when it says that the sons of Eli were corrupt, notice what it says following that. They did not know the Lord. Here they had grown up in the house of the Lord. Their father is the high priest of the Lord. They grow up in Israel among the people of the Lord. And these boys do not have a personal experience with God. Is it possible to grow up in the house of the Lord? Is it possible to be a preacher's kid? Is it possible to be a deacon or elder's child or the child of a Sunday school director in, in church and not know the Lord? It most certainly is. And Eli's sons here are proof of it. And not only are, do they not know the Lord, they're corrupt. King James, sons of Belial, which is one of the strongest statements. Basically, hey, you know what? They're not only don't know the Lord, they're like children of the devil in the house of the Lord. It's kind of startling what's going to happen now. So you have a family that is totally honoring the Lord with their life. And now we turn the corner or turn the page and we have a family that is in the highest, most prominent place of spiritual life in all the nation who is not honoring the Lord. So it says in verse 13, it gives a description of what they were doing to the people. It says, and the priest's custom, in verse 13, with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged flesh hook in his hand while the meat was boiling. Then he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and the priest would take for himself all the flesh hook brought up. So they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Also, before they burned the fat, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who sacrificed, Give meat for the roasting, for roasting to the priest, for he will not take boiled meat from you, but raw. And if the man said to him, They should really burn the fat first, then you may take as much as your heart desires, he would then answer him, No, but you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force." When people came to offer their sacrifices to the Lord, God had set up a, a beautiful plan how to take care of the house of the Lord. All the children of Israel were to offer a tithe to the house of the Lord. And of that tithe, the Levites, the larger tribe, they received that tithe. And then the Levites tithe, and then the house of Aaron, or the family of Aaron, received that. And God had a plan that the sacrifices that were offered, that there were sacrifices that were burned on the altar. Then there were sacrifices that the people would take part of it back and have, they would cook it. And basically it was a picture of having dinner or fellowship with God. And then also the priests took part of it and that's how they fed their family. Uh, the scriptures declare that don't muzzle the oxen while he treads the grain. And the picture is if you're laboring for the Lord, then a worker is worthy of his hire and you're going to be able to eat from the, the offerings that were made. But what his sons did, they took this great principle and they began to corrupt it. They began to, by force, because the priests would have to take boiled meat. First, they would offer the fat. The fat was the Lord's. And so the Lord was into fat-free way before fat-free was cool. People would offer the fat to the Lord and it would be this sacrifice, this sweet-smelling aroma to the Lord. And so, uh, but then they would... They would eat boiled meat, whatever came out on this flesh hook. But no, they were by force. They're like, no, we want to roast it. And I agree. I mean, I like, I like roasted meat better than boiled meat. But this was not the point. The point was, this is not what God had prescribed. 
And so the person came with a heart to worship God and to offer the sacrifice. And here these priests were doing the wrong job with the sacrifice. And if you even spoke up to tell them they were doing it all wrong, they said, hey, buddy, we're going to take it by force. And so what effect did that have on the people? It says in verse 17, therefore the sin of the young men, these are Eli's sons, was very great before the Lord. For men abhorred the offering of the Lord. People now became disgusted with going to God's house because all the priests wanted was, in our modern vernacular, was their money. Just wanted their hand in their pocket. And that can be charged in Christendom today. It's kind of sad. A lot of people don't want to come to church because of the overemphasis on money and what is going to be given And yet, to properly represent the Lord, you want to have that heart, we want to have that heart that people feel like they've been given something when they come to the house of the Lord. Now, we do receive an offering, but we don't make a big deal about it. We don't get pushy about it. There's no pressure. There's no coercion. It's just simply, hey, you know what? If if the Lord's blessing your life and you want to give and be a part of the work of the Lord, then praise the Lord. And, and we'll try to do the best we can with managing what the precious people of the Lord give. But you can see there's really nothing new under the sun. There are times that, like Eli's sons, they began to be forceful. And therefore their sin, it says, was very great to the Lord. And men abhorred it. So not only is the Lord very upset about this, but now people want nothing to do with the house of the Lord. They're just disgusted with it because of the sons of Eli, these corrupt boys. They don't even know the Lord. That's a crazy thing, isn't it? When you think about, uh, there, there are pastors in America that have reverend behind their name or they're a minister of this or that or they have a doctorate and uh, their biblical studies and yet there are people that honestly, seriously do not even know the Lord that are not born again. But because they say they're a pastor or they're a reverend or they're a minister, Everybody thinks they do know the Lord. There was a church here in town years ago, and I won't divulge uh, any details about it, but the assistant pastor actually really knew the Lord. He was born again. It was more of a mainline denominational church. And uh, he was born again and loved the Lord and loved to teach the Bible and believe the Bible. But he was serving under the senior pastor, and the senior pastor was not born again. And he said, you don't know how hard it is to serve at church underneath the senior pastor who is not even born again and doesn't even know the Lord. (laughs) And uh, I thought, man, how do you handle that? He goes, well, in our denomination, he kind of explained how things work and, and, uh, you know, praying for, once he discovered that, he was praying for reassignment somewhere. And may I be, please assign me to a church where the pastor knows Jesus. (laughs) Seems like a pretty straightforward request, doesn't it? But in these days, it's not. And in this day, it was not also. You know, the thing that's impressive, though, to me about Elkanah, Hannah, and their family is even though this was the reputation that the house of the Lord had received because of the sons of Eli, think about it. They still went there and worshiped because their eyes were on the Lord. They still, think about it, Hannah left her little three- or four-year-old boy there with Eli knowing that his other boys were corrupt boys. Now, that's a lot of faith, isn't it? That's like, whoa. Because I hear people say, you know, I just don't go to church, and they're all messed up, and this and that. Well, you know what? People, as I shared with you guys last week, people are people. And and there's always going to be weakness and flaws in church. But if your eyes are in the right place, on the Lord, you're still going to want to come and worship the Lord and hear his word. And to grow through that and not be um, stumbled by that. Well, in verse 18, but Samuel, this is a contrast from the boys that are corrupt, but Samuel ministered before the Lord even as a child, wearing a a linen ephod. Can't you just picture how cute this little tyke is? He's doing the Lord's work. He's going here and there, and Eli's telling him what to do and how to serve the Lord. Moreover, verse 19, his mother used to make him a little robe and bring it to him year by year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. You see, every male was required to go to Jerusalem to the three major feasts. So they would come in these increments from Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, and then Tabernacles. And as they would come, uh, you know, they're going to be able to come there 
three times a year and see their little boy. And no doubt he's shooting up and he's growing, but every year mom would bring a new little robe, guesstimating no doubt how he's growing and, and to be able to put that upon him. And, and he would not forget because of all the formative years. And so a little family reunion three times a year for Hannah, uh, Elkanah, and little Samuel. In verse 20, and Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, the Lord give you descendants from this woman for the loan that was given to the Lord. Then they would go to their own home. And the Lord visited Hannah, so she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. So Eli, when they come, they come three times a year. He's like, man, God bless you guys. You gave this little boy to the house of the Lord. May the Lord bless you with descendants. And so the Lord opened Hannah's womb, who could not get pregnant, no matter how much she prayed and cried and tried before this. Once she gives Samuel to the Lord, the Lord opens her womb, and she now has three sons and two daughters. So she's got six kids. Now, that would be an interesting family, wouldn't it? Their big brother, uh, you know, can you hear the, the, the little brothers and little sisters going, now, why is our brother at the house of the Lord? And why do we go visit him and take him a robe, but he doesn't come home with us? And how did all that happen? And how did you get pregnant, Mom? And all, all of this process that goes on. And yet it says here that um, as they honored the Lord with his son, Eli prayed for them that the Lord would bless them with descendants. I think the thing that people really don't get as they lay their life down and honoring the Lord is that if you'll seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these other things will be added unto you. Meaning that if you just seek the Lord, Lord, I just love you because I love you. I want to love you. I want to serve you. I'm all yours. And whatever you want to do in my life, that's cool with me. Because those who honor the Lord, that's their heart. You want to serve the Lord with this open-handedness, yet you share the, the dreams and aspirations of your heart because Hannah did. She said, man, Lord, I just want a son. And the Lord blessed her with that son. But now the Lord blesses her even abundantly. A barren woman now has six children. She's got three boys and two girls at home. And she's just, no doubt, overflowing with the joy of the Lord. When you will honor the Lord, can I just encourage you, people, Every now and then you'll hear somebody say, Lord, whatever you want in my life, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll do what you want me to do. My life is yours from now until I see you face to face. And some Christian will whisper in that person's ear and say, now be careful what you pray there. You, I mean, you pray like that, God's going to do something that's going to scare you. Like he's going to send you to Africa or something like that. And it's and what happens is Christians are reserved to be that open and with reckless abandon to serve the Lord because somebody's whispered in their ear that if you're that open with God, that somehow God's going to make your life miserable. And that is just such a lame characterization of our Father in heaven. Let me just share with you, if you with reckless abandon trust God, and you will do what he wants you to do and say what he wants you to say and go where he wants you to go. And your life is just poured out for him. God will bless you and give you opportunities to serve, literally, that people in this world would chop off their right arm to be able to do. They would do anything to get the opportunity that you have. But what they don't realize is you got that opportunity because you were willing for whatever God had for you. You never, ever, ever have to be afraid of God's will. Ever. Because God's will, will is beautiful. It's perfect. And with, when you with reckless abandon, hey, so what? God sends you to Africa. He's going to give you a love but for bugs and snakes. He's going to help you. Or if it's India or it's just serving here, whatever it is, God has a way of filling your life with the goodness of the Lord. When you honor him, he's going to honor you. It's just the way he is. And that doesn't mean that there aren't things that we have to surrender to and things that we have to die to. There are things in my life that I desired or wanted to pursue or this or that, that the Lord just brought those dreams to an end and said, no, that is not for you. I go, okay, you're the Lord. I, I receive that. 
It says at the end of verse 21, Meanwhile, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Now, Eli was very old, and he heard everything. Now, it's not that Eli didn't know. He heard everything his sons did to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And so he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, for it is not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. If one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? Nevertheless, they did not heed the voice of their father because the Lord desired to kill them. Whoa. And check this out. Not only are they, by coercion, messing up the offering system, but they are also in sexual immorality with the women that came to the doors of the tabernacle. Some believe that they were implementing what the pagan Canaanite people did and that there was basically a... um, you know, prostitution kind of connected with the cultic worship of the land of Canaan. And whether it was that or just simple immorality and guy likes girl type of thing, and they had a little, um, they were the (laughs) sons of Eli fan club, and they were ended up having sex with them. And Eli hears about this, and he, he confronts them, and he rebukes them, and he says, this is not a good report. I mean, if you sin against God, Who's left to intercede for you? It's one thing to sin against man, but you're, you're messing with God. Eli was like a lot of parents. Eli here even tells the truth, and I, I don't know what kind of loving relationship he had with his kids, but these are grown men. Eli did not have the backbone to discipline his kids. And so he talks to them verbally, and they go, yeah, whatever, Dad. And they go right back to it, back to their sexual immorality, back to pressuring the people for the sacrifices and the meat and really disgracing the Lord and disgracing the house of the Lord. There are some moms and dads that really can't put three things together raising kids, love, truth, and discipline. Your kids got to know that you love them like crazy. You're going to tell them the truth and what you expect of them. And when when they don't do what you expect, then there's discipline, there's consequences. I uh, read this little article. You might get a kick out of it. It's, I put a couple extras if you want it. So if you ask, ask afterwards out there at the information counter. It, it says, 12 steps to raise a juvenile delinquent. Do you want to know how to do it? Do you want to know how to? Because Eli raised a couple of juvenile delinquents, Hophni and Phineas. And this was written. This is a shocker. But the 12 steps to raise a juvenile delinquent was written by the Houston, Texas Police Department. Listen to what it says. Number one, begin with infancy to give the child everything he wants, and this way he will grow up to believe the world owes him a living. Number two, when he picks up bad words, laugh at him. This will make him think he's cute. It will also encourage him to pick up uh, cuter phrases that will blow off the top of your head later. Number three, Never give him any spiritual training. Wait till he is 21 and let him decide for himself. Number four, avoid using the word wrong. It may develop a guilt complex. This will condition him to believe later when he is arrested for stealing a car that society is against him and he is being persecuted. Number five, pick up everything he leaves lying around, books, shoes, clothing, do everything for him so he will be experienced in throwing all responsibility onto others. Number six, let him read any printed matter he can get his hands on. Be careful that the silverware and drinking glasses are sterilized, but let his mind feast on garbage. Number seven, Quarrel frequently in the presence of your child. In this way, he will not be too shocked when the home is broken up later. Number eight, give a child all the spending money he wants. Never let him earn his own. Why should he have things as tough as you had them? Number nine, satisfy his every craving for food, drink, and comfort. See that every sensual desire is gratified. Denial may lead to harmful frustration. 
Number 10, take his part against neighbors, teachers, policemen. They are all prejudiced against your child. When he gets into real trouble, apologize for yourself by saying, I never could do anything with him. And number 12, prepare for a life of grief. You will be apt to have it. When you think about what happens in the life of this family of priests, it's not unlike what is happening on the everyday street in America. And that is parents that don't have love, truth, and discipline don't bring about the correction that brings about a respect. Now it says here that they didn't listen to their father because the Lord's plan was to kill him. If there is no room for love, truth, and discipline in their lives, you see, Eli was the high priest. All he had to do was say, boys, I've heard what you're doing. You're done. You're out of here. Go figure out something else to do, but you're not going to do it in the house of the Lord. You're not going to dishonor the offering of the Lord, and you're not going to be living in sexual immorality with the girls right at the very door of the house of the Lord. Get out. Get out. But Eli lacked that resolve. Eli lacked the ability to bring that strong hand of discipline. And so, in contrast to Eli's sons, it says in verse 26, And the child Samuel grew in stature and in favor both with the Lord and men. It seems like such a, I mean, here's this dark, awful, sinful dynamic that's going on. And then, but here's Samuel in the house of the Lord. And here's Eli and his sons. But here's Hannah and Samuel in the house of the Lord. What a contrast between those who honor the Lord and those who do not want to honor the Lord. Eli, you see, was, or excuse me, Samuel was growing in stature physically. He was growing in favor with the Lord and men. He was growing spiritually. But we're going to discover in chapter 3, he doesn't yet have his personal encounter with God till chapter 3. And he's also growing in favor with men, the people that were like, man, that, that little guy has such a heart for the Lord, has such a tremendous heart for the Lord. Now, with all of this said, now God brings the prophetic word through a prophet without a name. This man shows up and he tells Eli what's up. He tells Eli in no uncertain terms what's going to take place. He says in verse 27, Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest? And to offer upon my altar to burn incense and to wear an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the offerings of the Lord and of Israel made by fire? Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling place, and honor your sons more than me, to make yourselves fat with the best of the, all the offerings of Israel, my people? See, now... The man of God, with the voice of God, as a prophet of God, comes to Eli and says, hey man, I chose you. I chose your family. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I gave you all of these sacrifices. I've done this incredible work in your life. Look what I've done in your life. But now Eli, and this is the crux of the matter for a father and his son. He says, but you honor your sons more than you honor me. Now, that can be said of us in human relationships. There may be somebody that we're honoring more. We put more weight on what they think and, and whether they like us or they don't like us than our relationship with the Lord. And the man of God rebukes Eli and says, why do you honor your sons more than you honor me? He says in verse 30, Therefore the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, far be it from me, for those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. He said, you know, I had a plan for your father's house. I had a plan for the lineage of Aaron. I had this great plan, but because of your sin and the sin of your sons, and because you honored them more than you do me, all that's now coming to an end. Because I want you to know this basic principle, the man of God is speaking on God's behalf, that the heart of God is a simple principle. When you honor me, 
I will honor you. If you honor the Lord, the Lord will honor you. And you can count on it. You can bank on it. Even if you go through adversity or difficulties, ask somebody like a young Joseph who honored the Lord throughout his life, but it, he, he could have questioned like, yeah, I'm honoring the Lord, but man, my brother sold me into slavery and, and I'm serving Potiphar and then Potiphar's life, wife lied about me and I ended up in prison and all those things. And yet the Lord honored him, but it was through the good, the bad, and the ugly. You have to, it, it's not over till it's over. It's not over till it's over. And the Lord can bring you through to this other spot. When you honor the Lord, he will honor you. If you put a lot of weight on who God is, he's going to put a lot of weight on you and who you are. Now, if you think about it logically and rationally, doesn't it make sense to honor the Lord more than any being or anything on planet Earth? Since he actually has the ability to reward. The Lord says, if you pray in secret and nobody else sees and nobody else hears, but I see, I'll reward you openly. And you want to tell people, hey, wouldn't it be better to pray in secret and have God o openly reward you, to give in secret and have God openly reward you, than to try to have people recognize you and pat you on the back for what you gave or how you prayed? Because God can honor you and reward you in ways that no man can, no woman can. And those who have been deeply honored in this life by the Lord were those who deeply honor the Lord. Hannah deeply honored the Lord. Samuel's going to deeply honor the Lord. And it's sad to say, it's kind of getting ahead of the story, but little Samuel that grows up to be a tremendous servant of God in the house of the Lord, he does the same thing as Eli. When his boys are old, they don't walk with the Lord like he does either. That's sad. It's a tough thing. Amen? I just want to encourage you, your fathers, it's no easy deal to be a man of God in the house of the Lord. To love your wife the way the Lord wants you to and to raise your kids the way the Lord wants you to and to, more than all of those things, honor the Lord, but to be that influence that God wants you to be. And so, that promise. But those who despise the Lord, he's going to lightly esteem. In verse 31, it says, Behold, the days are coming that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your house. And you will see an enemy in my dwelling place, despite all the good which God does for Israel. And there shall not be an old man in your house forever. But any of your men whom I do not cut off from my altar shall consume your eyes and grieve your heart. And all the descendants of your house shall die in the flower of their age. A heavy thing happens with this family that dishonors the Lord. The boys are dishonoring the Lord. Eli dishonors the Lord because he honors the boys more than the Lord. And now judgment comes on their household that now they're not going to be the, the, the royal priest family, if you will. They're not going to, the, God's going to remove them. And though he promised to do something in their life forever, their sin has so mucked up the plan that now God can't do all that he wanted to do through them. So he says, you know what? I'm going to set you guys aside. And all of the, you're not going to have old men in your family anymore. They're all going to die in the flower of their age. And if they don't die, they're going to consume your eyes and grieve your heart because of their situation in life. And they're going to just be begging for a piece of bread. What is going to happen to this whole household of priests is the judgment of God. The judgment of God. Because they would not honor him. And we see this taking place in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 27 and 35, where uh, Abiathar is removed from being the priest. And it, it takes years for all of this to play out. But it doesn't take that long for some things in the near future, just to give you a sneak preview. In chapter 4, we're only in chapter 2, in two chapters, the Ark of the Covenant is going to be taken from battle by the Philistines. In Hophni and Phinehas, the sons, they're gonna, it says here they're going to die in the same day that they go into battle with it and the Philistines capture the ark and they kill Hophni and Phinehas on the same day. So both these boys die. And the, now when a messenger comes back from the battlefield and he brings the message back, Eli, who is trembling because he's fearful about the ark of the covenant, says, hey, what's going on? Eli's 98 years old, his eyes are bad and it says he's a, he's a fat guy. He's sitting on a chair. And he says, what's going on? 
It's interesting the description that the Lord gives us about certain things. And the man said, hey, I just came from the battle. They, they captured the ark, and uh, Hophni and Phinehas, your boys, they're dead. And in that moment, when he heard about the ark, not his boys, but when he heard about the ark of God being captured by the enemies of the Lord, it says that he fell over backwards from his chair, and he's going to snap his neck and break his neck. The boys died on the day of the battle. The dad died. And then Phineas' uh, wife goes into, when she hears the report in town, she goes into labor because she was pregnant. And as she's going into labor, the child is going to be born. And the midwife says, it's okay, that you've got a boy. And she's dying. The woman's dying. And she dies giving childbirth. And she names the child Ichabod. She said, because the glory has departed. You see, the glory had departed because the ark was taken away. But more than that, the glory had departed when Hophni, Phinehas, and Eli let the corruption of the house of the Lord happen in the house of the Lord. In such a degree that God's heart was grieved and the congregation of the Lord was grieved because of the wickedness of the leadership in that situation. And so the heaviness that happens here is quite sobering. It says in verse 34, Now this shall be a sign to you that will come upon your two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas, in one day they shall die, both of them. And I just gave you that snapshot. Verse 35, Then I will raise up for myself a faithful priest, who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before my anointed forever. The Lord tells Eli through this man of God. He says, you know what? Your boys are going to die on the same day. And I'm going to raise up a faithful priest. Now we know that Samuel's going to grow up, and he's going to be a faithful priest. But many believe that he's looking all the way down through the ages to the ultimate faithful high priest that will never let anybody down, and that's the Lord Jesus. The Bible tells us that Jesus is our great high priest, that he's not only the great high priest in the Old Testament, the high priest would offer sacrifices and um, intercede for the people to God. But Jesus is not only the high priest who intercedes for us, but he's the sacrifice, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And that faithful high priest has made a way for you and I to experience the forgiveness of God and the love of God and a relationship with God that through the Old Testament was a bit at arm's length. When Jesus died on the cross and he said, it is finished, it tells us that the veil of the temple in the temple was torn from top to bottom. It was announcing, basically, now there's a new and living way that you can approach the God of the universe and experience the forgiveness of sins and know that your destiny is that of heaven. And that Jesus made a way that all can come and all can have access. You see, the problem with flawed, a flawed priesthood, as we saw with Eli and Hophni and Phinehas, is that it repels people. It repels people. Because there's, in this case, there was so much corruption. People abhorred bringing a sacrifice to the Lord like, what's the use? What's the use with these? What's going on? And so as, they, as the man of God shares this with Eli, he says, you know what, Eli? I've got to set you and your family aside because I really need a faithful priest. One who will do according, he says here, according to what is in my heart and in my mind I will build him a sure house. My anointed, he'll walk before my anointed forever. Verse 36, And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left in your house will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread and say, Please put me in one of the priestly positions that I may eat a piece of bread. The house of Eli, which was the priesthood, they all ate and got their sustenance from the priesthood. So down the road, guys are going to be begging to be able to have a privilege of a piece of bread where ultimately, you see, before they had a feast. If they would have just done the work of the Lord the way the Lord wanted them to, we wouldn't even be studying about this. 
Do you know the Lord? And does that knowledge of the Lord in your own walk with the Lord translate then into your family fiber, fiber and dynamic? Do you know Jesus and does your spouse know Jesus? And do the two of you now bring that knowledge of the Lord to your children? And do your, are your children walking with the Lord? Not because it happens by osmosis, but because you're talking to them and praying with them and walking with them and lying down with them and sitting with them and, and, and traveling with them and all that God has for us, according to Deuteronomy chapter 6, how to communicate that heart for God to the generation of our own children. So that we don't raise a generation, for us who are parents, raise a generation that are like the Hophni's and the Phineas's that are, are corrupt. Now, it doesn't mean that you can do all the things that you want, I mean, uh, in your training of, of your children in the house of the Lord, but they also still have choices. Man, you might have been, you, you might win the Christian Parent of the Year Award, but your son or your daughter has chosen to reject who the Lord is. And that's their choice. But you would never want them in a place of, of service to misrepresent that they actually know the Lord and they're in service like Eli did. He, he should have done something about that. You know, sometime along the way in our walk with the Lord, we, we, there's nothing harder than being a parent. And this passage is about a parent that honors the Lord and gives her son Samuel her name's Hannah. And it's about a parent by the name of Eli who does not honor the Lord because he honors his kids more than he does the Lord. And, you know, sometimes parents just lose a clear vision of what it means to raise their kids or to confront sin and corruption. And, and you know, you got to do the hard things if you're a parent. It's the hardest thing you're ever going to do in your life to speak the truth in love, to confront, to deal with that stuff. And ultimately, when it's all said and done, hopefully when each of us is gathered to his people, that we've made such an impact on our children and our grandchildren that there's a legacy of godliness that they actually want to walk with God because we gave them something to follow. Because we gave them something to follow. They would be able to say, my mom or my dad put more weight upon the Lord and his word than anything in this planet. They had a love for God and a love for his word and a love for obedience that gave us a great example to follow. And we went and tried the world and all the corruption of the world, being self-centered and selfish, being immoral. And we go, you know what? That doesn't satisfy. We're going to come to the place where we want to honor the Lord. I want to know tonight as we end this service, is there a weightiness of you honoring the Lord? Is the Lord the most dynamic, important, vital, personal relationship you possibly have? And if it is not, maybe tonight's the night that you could straighten out some priorities, that you could leave a legacy of blessing for those who would honor the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we just ask in Jesus' name right now, Lord, we want to honor you. And thank you for the promise that if we honor you, Lord, you will honor us. And Lord, we come to you with our weakness. We come to you with our sin and failure and ask that your blood would wash and cleanse. We come to you just, you know our frame, Lord. We're dust. And yet, Lord, with, with that cry of our heart, just want to honor you. Lord, we want to turn from a, a life and kind of a pattern in our, in our hearts that has been dishonoring. And so, Lord, we want to seek your forgiveness for that. And, Lord, have you bring about a real change in our hearts. So we're just in an attitude of prayer here tonight. Maybe we want the opportunity just to say, Lord, I, I want to honor you. I haven't been honoring you the way that I want to, and I, I really want to. I just want to give you the opportunity tonight to stand up right where you're at, and we want to pray for you, that the Lord will just strengthen you, strengthen you in that resolve to honor him. And so as we're just sitting here in the moment in prayer, if you want to honor the Lord, just stand up right where you're at.
God bless you guys. I'll pray for you. Pray that the Lord will just strengthen you by the power of His Spirit to do a work of grace tonight in each one of us. Honor the Lord in our families, in our marriages, with our kids. God bless you guys. Anybody else? I just want to pray for those who just say, man, I, I need the Lord's strength to honor Him. God bless you. People all over the room, praise the Lord. I want to honor the Lord. He sees you. He wants to honor you. Let's pray. Father, all the men and women that are standing right now, and with their hearts crying, just standing up, Lord, they're just crying out, Lord, I want to honor you, Father. I want to honor you. And with their hearts cry, Lord, also just asking for forgiveness, Lord. Just, I'm sorry, Lord that I haven't been honoring you the way I want to. And Lord, I pray that you would refresh me. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us. I pray that you would fill me with a supernatural empowerment by your Spirit. That you'd help me be the, the man of God, the woman of God you want me to be. You help me be the mom or the dad that I need to be for my kids, for my grandkids. Lord, I know I've, some things have really messed up. And I just ask that you would, you would rescue and redeem the mess we've made, Lord, from our failure to honor you. You say you'll restore that which the locusts have eaten. And so, Lord, we pray for a restoration, a healing, Lord, of our own sin and failure. But today, Lord, your mercies are new. And we just receive, Lord, from you that strength and empowering to be a vessel that honors you with all of our hearts. And, Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.